99 times out of 100, my reasons are just excuses wearing fancy clothes. So I gotta decide, like, am I gonna live my life according to my excuses slash reasons or to my commitment? I'm gonna go back out there. I got like the sweltering heat. I got that horrible foot pain. I got the snake riddled roads of Colorado 10. They're waiting for me. In fact, like basically hell's waiting for me. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. My guest today, returning for his second appearance on the show, is multi-platinum, Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter and now adventure athlete, Mike Posner. Best known for his infectious pop meditations on grief, loss, celebrity, art, and growth, Mike's songs have accrued billions of streams. It's a career that Includes writing for and with some of music's biggest stars, people like Justin Bieber, Pharrell, Maroon 5, Tom Morello, Snoop Dogg, Nick Jonas, and Avicii. Quite a bit, however, has changed since Mike and I last sat down. Over the last two plus years, Mike literally walked 2,000 miles across America, and he followed it up this past year by summiting Mount Everest, racking up a depth of wisdom along the way. Mike is an old soul. He is a deep and truly beautiful human that wears his heart on his sleeve. He's a guy who's always questing for deeper meaning and authenticity. He channels it all into both his art and his life in a way that I personally find deeply inspiring. And this conversation, much like our first, is just stellar. As a bonus, Mike was kind enough to perform a few songs. So we're gonna open this one up with one such song and be sure to stick around to the very end as Mike takes us out with a second live performance you're not gonna wanna miss. Somebody told me God is simply what we don't know. I saw a butterfly, it was dead but it was gorgeous. And all the robots are just walking down the sidewalk Kings of the little empires that they made up And I'm wide open Ooh-hoo. Yeah, I'm wide Dusty got shot and the no sure got married Stewie's still dead and commitment's still scary And I got a new woman but I treat her like my old one If I keep this shit up I know I'll end up with no one And I'm Good to see you, man. I appreciate you coming in to do this. Like we said a minute ago, so much has happened in your life since the last time we sat down and chatted. I feel oddly like very connected to you, even though we don't talk. Like mm. it was when you came in, I was like, oh yeah, I just saw him last week. Or, you know, I, I don't know what that what that is. There's some intangible thing, but um, I think you just make people feel very comfortable and at ease. Thank you. I feel you know, strange because I feel the exact same way about you. I feel comfortable around you. And um, you're right. Even though it's been a few years, I've I've felt connected, connected to you. Um, so maybe we're just like reflecting back the, the good yeah. parts of each, of or each other. Or either that or there's some past life thing going yeah. on. I don't know. <laughs> we, were um, bro- we were brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and the last time we did this show, uh, I mean, the audience really loved it. I mean, you're definitely an audience favorite. Uh, so I think people are going to be really happy to see your face again. Hey, I'm happy yeah. to be here. Um, before we Truly. get into any of this stuff, there's so much catching up we have to do. 
the first thing that I have to comment on is I know that you in NQ recently went and spent some time with our mutual friend, Doug Evans out in the desert. That's that right. Is like growing compound out there. That's right. And you left that experience like this new sprouting evangelist. <laughs> like you're making yeah. videos about sprouting. Well, I mean, Doug has that effect on people. Yeah, yeah. Doug, Doug's one, he's, I could call him one of my best friends. I talk to that guy a lot. He's an unbelievable Almost every day. Being. And um, so I, I was already sprouting a little bit, um, but it's really, um, I spent, spend some time with my family. I, I, I told you I have a house in Michigan and, mm -hmm. and when I'm there, I spend time with all the levels of my family um, from my from like the babies to the elders. And uh, we got a pretty strong late onset Alzheimer's thing going on. I've done my 23 Me, I got both mm -hmm. of those genes from both my mom and my dad. So um, I really used to want to start taking that serious you know, to do whatever I can and not get that. So the growing the, the sprouts at home is, is it's been awesome. It's been fun. I'm eating like upwards of four ounces of sprouts a day, which is basically like an entire mason jar full. Yeah. And uh, it's great. I do a staggered system. So I have eight jars. Like when I first started doing it, I just start all eight at once. Then mm -hmm. I had like eight jars and then I did that too. And I had so many sprouts. I couldn't, <laughs> there's no way I could possibly eat right. all of them. So now what I do, I start a new one each day. So the, always there's one that's like a, a perfectly like ripe. It's still right. growing. And then the it time. like goes, in, I mean, there's nothing better, you know, like you can buy sprouts from the store and they're still really good for you, but they've probably been there a day or two. These sure. are like alive still. And then they're, they're going in the body. So yeah, the sprouts is, is awesome, man. And I've really started to dial in. You know, like I always had my macros, right? I was never eating a lot of sugar or mm -hmm. like high carbs or anything like that. But just, you know, dialing in like, where's this stuff coming from? Is there like poisonous toxins in there or not, you know? And going to the farmer's market more and just start taking more serious uh, because I, you know, I don't want to get Alzheimer's. Yeah. 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 I feel you, man. I got some of that in my family as well. But you spend time with Doug and it's not gonna be long before you're like 100% fully raw vegan. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He has such an infectious energy and you just wanna follow his lead because he has so much enthusiasm for these lifestyle habits. He's so passionate about it and you can't help but like, you know, yeah, sort of absorb all of that energy. I agree. He's and a you beautiful sat in the man. tubs that he's got out there <laughs> oh, yeah. and everything. Well, he's got all these great hot springs there. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I spent, got the opportunity to spend some time with Wim Hof. I said, Doug, you right. gotta get some ice, you got some ice baths out here, man. So he we were working have, he on that. He doesn't have the ice baths going on yet? No, he will. Yeah, he, he will. will. I'm sure he will. <laughs> I know you spent time with Wim. We're gonna talk about that. First of all, man, you look great. You look healthy. Thank you. It's the sprouts, man. Yeah, it's the that's sprouts. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you share these recipes on like TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, I do this. So do the, the Posner sprout recipe, take some broccoli sprouts, drizzle it with hemp seed oil, pink Himalayan sea salt, and uh, nutritional yeast. And that's it. You just throw it just down. eat it straight. Dude, it's great, man. And I, I don't, I'm, you're right. Doug has infected me. So like anytime artists come over to work in the studio, I'm always like giving them sprouts. Right. And they're like, hesitantly like putting it in their mouth and they're like, this is all, like I could eat this all day. And I'm like buying them a sprout uh -huh. kid. It's great. This is the real bud. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, you're back in LA. Welcome back to town. Thank you. I know you've been collaborating and back in the studio and making music, but when we last talked, it was right on the precipice of you uh, beginning your walk across America. So let's like traverse that experience first. Great. Um, yeah, after we spoke, I uh, was getting ready to go and I, I I actually got injured before I even started. I walked into I a, that. I can't remember if this is right after we spoke or right before, but um, I, you know, I had the date set March 1st, 2019. I was gonna start in Asbury Park, New Jersey. I posted on Instagram, people were gonna come, it's gonna be this beautiful thing. And I was outside at this like pool party. Everyone is like drinking and stuff. I'm not, I'm focused because I'm getting ready to walk across America in a month. And I walk, I go inside to get a water and I walk into the leg of a 
table and I break my pinky toe and uh, I had a stress reaction on my second metatarsal. So it was like, I went to the doctor and he's like, man, if you want any shot of completing this, like you got to let this heal. And it's like, okay, so before I even go, before I even take my first step is a reason for me to quit. Right, obstacle number one. Yeah, and it's just like, okay, there's gonna be a lot, many more of these. And uh, I let the thing heal and uh, I show up um, off the coast of New Jersey, Asbury Park, and I got two feet in the ocean, the saltwater waves are crashing over me. And to be honest, I'm I'm scared because I told everybody that I'm gonna walk across America and the, it's 2,800 miles, we think, the route that we, we've picked. And I just have no idea if I can actually do it. I have a belief uh, inside me, you know, but I don't really know for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. There's no way to like, really no there's no way to like fully prepare you can't do like half the you know what i mean but that's true of tackling anything hard of course you want to know exactly how it's going to play out you want to know what steps you're going to have to take you want to be able to foresee every obstacle and how you're going to meet it and it just doesn't work that way no so with all this anxiety and uncertainty i I stand with the in the ocean and I take my first step. And step one is take one step, right? Step one is take one step. And I keep walking. I walk across the lush fields in New Jersey. I walk across coal country in Pennsylvania where I share the road with Amish buggies. Um, I see a double rainbow in Ohio. I start to develop like horrible plantar fasciitis, which I'm sure you're no stranger to. And like... I wake up in the morning and I can like barely stand up, mm. but I keep going anyways. I, I walk across Indiana, uh, Illinois. I walk into Missouri during a heat wave where, you know, like the weatherman's on TV saying, stay inside. I'm like, screw it. I'm going to walk 24. I'm walking usually 24 miles a day. Um, I walk into Kansas, I walk across Kansas um, where I just saw unbelievable shooting stars and uh, like orange sherbet sunrises every morning behind me that are so beautiful that I'm turning around to walk backwards. I'm walking to Colorado and I've walked 1,797 miles at this point when, ah, mm -hmm. I think what the, like pain shoots up my leg. I'm like, what the heck was that? And then I, I hear a sound I want to hear. And I realize that poisonous rattlesnake just, just sunk its fangs yeah. into my, my left ankle. And at first I'm not thinking too much of it. I'm trying to just stay calm, but I glance around and there were two fans there that showed up to walk with me. But no gas station, no barns, no houses, not even any cows. Like, this is bad. They call 911. And uh, while they call 911, it was sort of like uh, the end of Looney Tunes, if you remember that, mm -hmm. where it goes like this. The, right. the circles converge on the center of the screen and it says, that's all, folks. Well, that's exactly what started happening to me, except instead of colorful circles, it was darkness and just, you know, blacks creeping in from the corners of my awareness and I could feel myself fading away. Now they let me speak to 911 and dispatch says, sir, I've sent an ambulance from two different towns and a helicopter, whatever gets there first, get in. And I asked, am I going to die? At the the voice on the other line says, I don't know, sir. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, this, it's not a bee sting, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, an hour later, I'm in the 
the back of an ambulance. Um, it, it just dawns on me that like, this could be the end of my life. This could be, hopefully not, you know, hopefully like they get me there all works out, but could not. And I just, just, I made a decision, Rich, that if indeed it is going to be the like end of my life, I'm not going to waste it worrying about if it's the end of my life. Like, so I literally have this moment in the back of the ambulance where I'm just reclining. I always feel like I was in like some enlightened state. And right when I made that decision, I started to like see, like the colors became more vibrant. The light, I noticed this red paint on the back of the ambulance door and it was like really red. It was beautiful and vibrant and alive. And um, it was just peace and everything made sense. Um, long story short, I go to the ICU for three days. I thought, you know, they have this medicine called anti-venin. Right. And I thought- Just get the shot. I thought if I get that, because it's called anti-venin, I thought it, I thought I'd be walking the next day. Mm Mm-hmm doesn't work like that. The anti venom just like makes it so you don't die, you know? But the doctor for, you know, you're going to be here a while. You got to watch your leg. And um, my leg swelled like basically the size of an elephant trunk. Yeah. You shared photos of that on yeah. Instagram. Yeah. It was very haunting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it got real big and real painful. And uh, I went from 20, walking 24 miles every day to like, I, I couldn't walk to the bathroom without help. I had a walker and like somebody, you know, right. holding me. Relearning how to walk. I mean, I think, were you in the hospital for five days or something? I was in the hospital like five days, ICU for three. And then, um, you know, due, due to amazing medical care at, at Parkview Hospital in Colorado, I, start, I started to get better. And then actually came like the hardest part of the snake bite. I wasn't actually getting bit by the snake. The hardest part of the snake bite was getting better from the snake bite mm-hmm. because, you know, I went after the hospital, I wasn't ready to go. I, I, I basically had to rehab, it took three weeks. Right. You went back to Michigan, right? That's right. To kind of heal up. That's right. And while I was there, everyone is like coddling me, cooking for me, wishing me well. You know, they're putting me on the news. John Mayer is DMing me on Instagram with saying speedy <laughs> recovery. I'm in like this nest of cuddly, sympathetic softness. Right. And the idea of putting yourself back into that difficult situation becomes all the harder. Is horrible. After the break. And, and yeah, three weeks, past, and I just can't deny it any longer. My, my ankle was healed. And so... I'm looking at the map and I have 1,000, you know, that's 38 marathons. I have 1,000 hot, horrible miles left. And um, I got to decide, like, just like when I walked into the table and got hurt before, like, I have another reason. This is a great reason, actually, because if I quit, no one will even think I'm a quitter. Mm-hmm. They're like, hey, I almost died. It wasn't meant to be, whatever. But I started to realize like 99 times out of 100, my reasons are just excuses wearing fancy clothes. I said, they're the same. Reason, excuses, same thing. So I got to decide like, am I going to live my life according to my excuses slash reasons or to my commitment? And I said, screw it, man. I'm gonna go back out there. I got like the sweltering heat. I got that horrible foot pain. I got the snake riddled roads of Colorado 10. They're waiting mm-hmm. for me. In fact, like basically hell's waiting for me. And uh, it's like, screw it. You know, yeah. I wanna meet hell too. Let's go. So I go back to the exact spot. And I was like scared, man. I was having like nightmares about snakes. I still don't like snakes, you know? <laughs> I didn't want to go back to that spot. Yeah. You know? Of course. It was scary. The PTSD of it. It was scary. What's interesting is to kind of create a little bit more context for this. 
The whole idea behind the walk, I mean, I know there's this kind of origin story. You were in Teeny's jewelry shop and somebody had mentioned that yeah. they had a friend who did it and that yeah. kind of planted the seed. But the seed is germinated over the course of you completing this album and being faced with the prospect of having to do the traditional kind of promotion behind it and realizing like you couldn't get up for it. Like I just can't do that. Yeah. And the obstacles there being like all of these people who are so heavily invested in the success of this music, it took a lot of gumption and courage to opt out of that and say, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do this other thing. And I'm sure there were a lot of people who weren't very happy about that at yeah. the time. Um, I'm not sure if we covered it last time. You can, I don't know if you remember either. Yeah. It was a while ago, I but- I didn't go back and listen to it. We probably <laughs> did talk about it, but- But uh, yeah, I was, um, I, 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 I had the dream of doing it like five years. And um, you're right. I, I, I felt like I was just caught under the weight of my own life. And I had done all the research about the walk across America. It turns out there's a strategy to it. It's best to start east to west because of where the mountain ranges line up and best to start in spring, early spring, in an effort to be done before winter. Mm -hmm. So each time spring rolled around, it was something in the way. Right. It's an album I got to finish. There's a, a tour I got to do to support the last it's album. Be convenient. There's a wedding I got to go to. And I just, I, I just didn't do it. Five years. I was letting my dream die. And I, I, I felt it, man. It's like I started to have this like low level depression kind of creep into my life. And I was talking to another guy. I think we, we have in common, Elliot Biss now. Mm -hmm. Sure. Elliot and I went to the same high school. Is that right? Yeah. How about that? So I was talking to Elliot. Julie talks to Elliot all the time. Amazing. Yeah. He's another like guy who just exudes superhuman enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, let me talk to him because I, I feel utterly uninspired and maybe his positivity will like through our conversation seep into me you know and so i told him yeah i was like dude i just can't do this anymore this whole like mike posner show going on the road you know doing the shows yeah put your hands up. I, was like, I can't do it he goes well what do you want to do i said what i really want to do is walk across america but I told my manager that they all think it's crazy. He goes, that's great news. And I'm like, what do you mean? That they think it's crazy, it's great news. So I'm confused. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? He goes, you gotta understand, not all crazy ideas are great, but all great ideas are crazy. And I think you walking across America is a great idea. That was it. He told me and that. You got to live your I life, man. It. I felt it like the dream the, deferred. I could feel the truth underneath what he was saying. And it was just like, there's never going to be a right time. No one's going to roll out a red mm -hmm. carpet for me. People are always going to have a reason why I shouldn't do this. You're going to hurt your body. You're going to, like, your career is going to suffer. I'd hurt them all, but it was like, this is my life. And I'm either going to live it, like, this is either going to be a part of my life, this walk, this dream. Or I'm going to live some other like crappy version that I know isn't my truth. Right. But there's also this idea of what the walk was going to be like versus the reality of it. And on some level, yeah. you could frame it as a unique and different way to promote your music. Like, I think there was this sense like the music's coming out and I'm going to go from town to town. I'm going to play these shows and walk with a bunch of people. And it'll actually be like kind of a, grassroots way of sharing my music in a different, you know, format essentially, yeah. that it would be like this moving carnival across <laughs> America. And it started out like that. It looked like, and I remember you sharing on Instagram, you would be in these college towns or whatever, and there'd be a bunch of young people and you kind of end the day with a little mini concert. Yeah. But then slowly but surely the people start to fall away and the reality sets in of just how difficult this is gonna be.
thought it would be a little bit more of like a hippy dippy experience. Right. I'd meet some beautiful people. Like, hey, you seem nice. Maybe I'll spend a few days here. Um, but then start to look at the map and the miles. And it's like, you got these freaking <laughs> doing this for the next two and a half years. You got these freaking Rocky Mountains, you know, and they're 2,000 miles away. And look, I don't want to be there in November. I want to be there in August, you know, mm -hmm. or September at the latest. And so the math just didn't work with that like hippy divvy thing, you know, it became this, it became this uh, exercise in extreme discipline because it is, it's freaking hot, you mm -hmm. know, and you're walking through the summer in, you know, Missouri and Kansas. So it's like, you can't roll out of bed at, 10 a.m. and start trying to get 24 miles and you're going to cook. So I had to get up at, I didn't have to do anything. I chose to get up at four every day and start try to be walking by five. And I could get pretty much my 20, 20 of my 24 mm -hmm. miles in before it started to get really hot. Anyways, I say this to, to illustrate that I never wanted to do it. Like every day my alarm went off and I never wanted to get up. It's 4 a.m. <laughs> I right. wanted to sleep more, you know? And musicians don't wake up early this, anyway. Right. And so you're probably not a morning guy, <laughs> constitution. I like to be, you know, like my job makes it hard sometimes. Like sometimes we start work at right. 10 p.m. So you, you don't want to be super tired. Anyway, but on this walk, yeah, I never wanted to do it. And like, I just had to decide every day I'm going to do this anyways. And um, it didn't matter. Also, it didn't matter how I felt emotionally. Like the thing went off 4 a.m. And some days I felt sad. Great. Get up and walk. Right. Doesn't matter. And the next day you feel happy. It's like, great. Get up and walk. And I start to realize like, I don't know anybody that's, happy all the time or always in the zone. I'm certainly not, but I know people that show up all the time, you know, like they, they're there for their commitment. Their word means something. I want to be one of those people. And I do remember us talking about that last mm -hmm. time. Yeah. This was, idea that integrity is super important and that, that shows up on the Everest challenge as well. Like yeah. I said, I was going to do this thing. Like I'm going to do the thing. Yeah. And on, on Everest, that was the only thing left. We could talk about that later. But um, yeah, I went back to the freaking spot. Snake bit me. And I walked, you know, where it bit me, I could just see the Rockies on the horizon. They're like real small. And it was really cool to see the Rocky Mountains that haven't walked from the Atlantic Ocean. So I just, you know, went back to the spot, took a step, kept taking steps, went up and over the Rocky Mountains. And then like, I felt like I had an invincibility cloak. It's like the, this snake bit me. I went over the mountains. I could do anything. I started to dream while I walked. Uh, I started like to have this vision of myself climbing Everest after the walk was over, but I still had a long way to go. So I had to stay focused. And I walked across Colorado, walked across the Navajo Nation. Um, Walked across Nevada, walked into California, you know, walked through the Mojave Desert, walked into LA. I could see the Hollywood sign on my right, kept walking, you know, the pavement turned into sand at Venice Beach, kept walking. My walk escalated to a sprint in six months, three days after I started, after walking 2,851 miles, I dove into the Pacific Ocean. And, uh, I thought I'd feel accomplished, but interestingly, I didn't feel accomplishment mm -hmm. in the water. I felt possibility. It felt like the first day of my life. I think that's a really crucial insight. This idea that there are no finish lines, that it's just another step on your path. Yes. Yeah. Like notch in your, in your belt but really just a checkpoint, right? This idea of checkpoints rather than kind of endpoints. Yeah. And when you have, when you can kind of contextualize your, your accomplishments in that way, 
I think that keeps the ego at bay a little bit. It allows you to have a little bit more gratitude and humility and keeps you on track for what's next. Yeah. I think it's fine to celebrate these things and acknowledge like I did this hard thing, yeah. of course, right? Yeah. But you gotta keep moving. That's right. And um, I shouldn't have because my body is pretty jacked up. Like I'm, I'm sure you've been there probably worse than me, you know, but just from doing that same repetitive motion for six months. I'm sure. Know, um, it just hurt, man. It hurt, like if I sat down, I stood up, like it really hurt. Everything just hurt bad. Like, you know, I was a little worried that it would feel like that forever. Like maybe I jacked myself up. Mm -hmm. um, but I was so like, I was so hypersensitive of over celebrating it that I had this uh, boxing coach, Coach Marcelo in LA. And I said, can you meet me at 4.30 tomorrow? He said, yeah, no problem. So the day after I finished the walk, I go boxing with him. Right. Cause I just needed, like, I needed Switch to- gears. I needed my Hard body reset. and my spirit and my mind to know, look, we're not done. Like this thing is over, this chapter, but beginnings hide themselves in ends. You know, like we're gonna, we're working tomorrow too. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just had to get up early and like work hard again the next day. Yeah. And uh, during the walk, I had somehow Elliot connected me to Colin O'Brady. You know, Colin. I sure. Think. And uh, well. Colin, I started to ask him about Everest because he had summoned it before. Well, before we even okay. get into that, like, <laughs> sorry, well, jump there's the a couple gun. things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. We got time, bro. We can breathe. Before we completely move off the walk, I know that there was this idea. Well, first of all, when you were in the hospital, I just remember you sharing videos um, of that experience and being with the walker and and you know being really transparent about what you were going through at the time. And I don't remember the details of that other than like seeing this person who was incredibly positive, like you were smiling and you were mm. like happy. Like that's the moment where you're like, shit, man, this whole thing went out the window. I didn't want this to happen. It's a disaster but you had this big smile like you yeah. do right now. And yeah. you're like, I'm in here and these they're treating me so well. And they like, were, yeah. where does that facility to hold on to that kind of unbridled level of optimism come from? You got Goggins, one word, Goggins. And I don't remember what, I don't remember if it was in his book or on your podcast or on another podcast, but I heard him talking about visualization and I believe in like the law of attraction, all that stuff. Like before I went on this walk, I was writing in my notebook, I, Mike Posner, will walk across America like a hundred million times. I'm mm -hmm. going on walks just saying that like it's my mantra in my head and until I really believe it. Okay, we know about that kind of visualization, you're visualizing yourself being successful. But somewhere, maybe it was in his book, I heard Goggins say, you gotta visualize when things go wrong too. And so before I left, I did that. And uh, I, d I visualized like myself breaking a leg on the walk somewhere. And I just visual, I saw myself like rehabbing it, going back to the same spot where it broke and finishing. So I just, I, I already, already rehearsed that whole thing. I already, like, okay, like, here we go. Yeah. This, is, this is what happens. It was already, the decision was made. And um, so I never had to battle that internally at that time of the injury because I'd already done it mm -hmm. in my head. So I got, I got our boy, David, the yeah, thanks for go. that. It's and um, to have that impact on people. And it's like, I had, <sighs> Some like law of attraction person might say, well, maybe you attracted the injury. Maybe I did, you know, but like I had done enough research on this thing and talked to enough people that had done the walk to know like, hey man, you're not gonna go almost 3000 miles without something bad mm -hmm. happening. That's actually why you're going right, in the 100%. first place. You wanna go feel that, that horrible moment and see if you're gonna decide to keep going. Right, that's why you're doing it. Those are the teachable moments. That's right. Those are the those are the experiences yeah. that give it 
the value that you're seeking. That, and there's a second part to that optimism, which is way less uh, uh, valiant <laughs> or noble, is like, hey man, we're out there. It's just like, it's just hot and hard. Right. And when I was hurt, you know, my, my left leg was like in a lot of pain. The rest of me actually felt really good taking a break. Mm -hmm. And like, I was in air conditioning, I was sleeping in a nice bed. So it was easy to and smile about that And nobody could harsh on you stuff. for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that was like part of convenient. it too. Like the, the hospital is a lot nicer than the, than the walk. What were uh, some of the more impactful experiences that you had besides the, the rattlesnake bite along the way? I mean, I know- sure from people, I know a bunch of people who've run across America and walked it, et cetera. Um, and one of the recurring themes that always comes up is how profound it is to traverse the Navajo nation. Yeah. Um, that was a place that I was warned about before I got there by white people. You say, be careful when you go there, bad stuff happens, that kind of thing. And uh, when I got there, there was just this outpouring of love and support from the from the Dene people. Dene is what they call themselves. Sure. Navajo is like mm -hmm. a white word, just like got thrown on them. And yeah, man, I, so basically on the walk, most of the time you're walking on the side of a, busy road and um, people were just stopping all day and they'd come out on the shoulder of the road and they say, can I pray for you? I say, yeah, of course. And they would pray for me in their language and they'd, they'd give me gifts like arrowheads mm -hmm. and someone even gave me like a, a eagle feather, which is like this very high honor that I definitely did not deserve. Um, but like, let's be real about it. I'm a white guy walking on their land. They should be uh, skeptical of me. They have all the reasons, talk about reasons. They have reasons to be skeptical of me, maybe even reasons to be uh, hostile to me, but they weren't. They were just loving. And and that sort of love for no reason touched me deeply. And uh, yeah, just that, that 180 miles was, if, if that was the whole trip, that would have yeah, been life-changing. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, um, another story. So after I got off the Navajo Nation, I was walking on the Wallapai Reservation in Arizona. And uh, this big red F-350 like pulls to the side of the road. I'm sort of like hesitant. Like it's, I don't know, I have some judgment or bias mm -hmm. about the person who would drive that kind of big truck. I'm like a little scared of them, even though I haven't even seen them yet. And this young man gets out of the truck and he, he's on the other side of the highway because I, I walk into traffic always. I want to see the people. Mm -hmm. And so he runs across the highway dangerously. And it's a 21-year-old named Rowan. And we sort of have small talk for a while. And before I left, uh, this friend of mine taught me a question that you can ask that basically like if you get caught in small talk, it's like a cheat code to go deeper. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if I pray for you, what should I pray for? And so I asked That's this, a good one. yeah, I asked this young man, if, if I pray for you, what should I pray for? And his name is Rowan. He is 21. And he, he thought about it. And he looked at me and he said, uh, five years ago, my dad died from drinking. And Three years ago, my only sibling, my big brother, died from drinking. 
And just three months ago, my mom died from drinking. And he said, if you pray for me, pray for my sobriety, because I'm the only one left. Mm. And then he turned and he ran back across the highway dangerously. He reached into his red F-350, he pulled out this small leather satchel. He runs back across, he puts it in my hand. He looks me in the eye, he says, this sweet grass and sage. This will keep you safe while you walk on our land from bad spirits. And he got back in his truck and he, he drove away with a hand out the window like that. And you just like moments like that, they're, they're everything, you know. Uh, That's beautiful. I mean, I can, think, yeah, go sorry, ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I couldn't help but reflect on the extent to which like death is this theme that looms large over so many of these pivots and decisions that you've made. I mean, in many respects, you can track the decision to doing this walk back to the grief and the self-reflection that came with losing your dad and you know Avicii and Mac Miller and all these people that you've been close with in your life who have passed away, um, leaving you, you know, to ask these deeper questions about yourself and your purpose and what it's all about and all of that. And so it's almost like perfectly orchestrated for Rowan to cross your path and share his version of that experience. And when I hear that, it just affirms to me like, oh, this is, this was meant to be, you're on the right path. Like this is what this is about. Yeah. And I just, I, I just can't get over his spirit. Meaning like, what do I mean by that? Like how, when he was telling me that story, he wasn't looking for sympathy. Like he was there to support me. That's why he showed up to give me that thing. You know, it's like, how, like how can someone who's been through so much have so much left to give still? And that was just beyond beautiful mm -hmm. to me, mm -hmm. you know? And I'll, I won't forget it. Yeah. I think you came across somebody who was doing an unsupported transcontinental run yeah. also, right? Like I, my friend Ricky Gates did that. Um, He's got crazy stories about, I mean, that's a whole other yeah. level, but that's also like a shot in the arm of like, hey man, look, when you think it's hard, totally. what this guy's doing, he's sleeping on the ground. It's so cool because when like you make a decision and I'm sure you've experienced this in your life too, you make a decision, you're gonna do this thing. And uh, like for me, for our example's sake, like is the walk across America, we can use that. Um, Everyone in my normal life think that's like a pretty wild thing to do. But all of a sudden by making the decision, I'm thrust into this new community of walkers and runners. And in this community, uh, I'm not special at all. In right. fact, it's I'm probably- It's normalized. It's normalized. Yeah. And actually like in that community, I was probably in touch with eight people or so that were either walking or running while I was. And I was the least impressive one of the bunch by far, by far I was walking supported meaning I had a friend going ahead of me in an RV that was like getting food finding places for us to sleep and also I didn't have to carry everything because we had this support vehicle so I just got like a little camel back on mm -hmm. you know and uh you're right there was the uh, this other guy like this is actually the day before the snake bite it's in Colorado and uh we're in La Junta and yeah Somehow on Instagram, we had noticed each other and we figure out, hey, it's this guy named Stevie. He's going west to east. He's running unsupported and I'm walking east to west. We're going to freaking cross. So we said, hey, we got to, we got to link up, right? Um, so we're texting and we cross in La Junta and look, Rich, like, he seemed like a really nice guy, but this thing is like tough. So I ain't going east, okay? Uh huh. I go west, man. That's it, dude. 
right? Like, or maybe you meet like, and it's like, yeah. who's if we're gonna hang out? Who's which direction? Like, if are we you want to talk in? here for a while, but I'm not like I'm go. I go east, yeah. bro. This guy, like, we didn't talk about it either, but he's like, he just turned around and he walked 16 miles with me backwards mm. to be with me to connect. He he had a giant backpack on. And he was running 40 miles per day. Uh, he had a ukulele like bungee corded to like the outside of it. He didn't even use a tent. He would just sleep on the ground. Um, he'd wake up sometimes like police kicking him in the head. And like he, just everything I did was times a hundred. And then I remember he, he asked me, he goes, what do you do for uh, music and headphones? I said somewhat proudly, I said, the first eight miles I walk every day is a silent meditation walk, you know? I thought it was like really doing it. And then I go, and then after that, you know, so I put the head on, I call Elliot, stuff I right. talk like about. Rolling I walk. calls. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, I didn't bring headphones. Right. What? He goes, I didn't bring, he goes, I just wanted to be deep with myself. He goes, sometimes I look on the phone for directions, but other than that, it's just me me alone in here. He goes, it was horrible at first, but after a month, it's the best thing I ever did. I found a clarity that I didn't even know was possible inside me. And uh, yeah, stuff like that, just inspiring, you know, inspiring. Yeah. And uh, the next day I got bit by the snake, I got better. And, and when I went back, I said, look, like I'm still gonna walk supported, but no headphones the rest of the trip, you know, like I'm going to do it how Stevie does it, you know, and just, just here, that's it. No calls or if I'm walking, I'm just walking. And you did that. Yeah. A thousand more miles. And it was, mm. he was right. You know, it was like the, the clarity you got just, it was unlike anything I, I knew. And what, before. like, how would you characterize or articulate like what that experience taught you like that latter half of the walk where you really went deep and inward in a way that you hadn't before just having the time to stop you know like let's say somebody a friend or something did something that bothered me or whatever usually i'm moving so quick i might not even think about i'm like oh i'm just off to the next thing but then you have you know you have eight hours to think about it and so everything was just all my relationships cleaned up you know if there was something that bothered me with someone like i'd finished that day or some I call that person. We, I say, hey, that that thing pissed me off, you know. <laughs> or like, let's talk about this. And um, with the a absence of more stimuli all the time, more planning, my life became very simple, you know. Whereas before, I was doing a tour and I have this and work on that opportunity, and it was like, and I just get up and walk. My life became very simple, and. Uh, that gave me the space to like have everything cleared from the past so I could just be present, you know? And right. um, I think that's really the the point, you know, I forget we, and after Everest, like I, I went on a retreat and was reminded of this, but we're supposed to like be, we're supposed to be here. We're supposed to be present. We're supposed to have enthusiasm and love and joy inside us. Um, we're not supposed to spend our lives planning about the future always. Sure, you need to do that somewhat, but we're, we're not supposed to spend our time dwelling on the past. We're supposed to be like in our bodies, like our mind should be in the same place as our body, you know? And, uh, creating some space to just stop, you know, yeah. was Human beings was have a hard time with that though. We're not wired to be able to hold on to that. And the half-life of those types of experiences, whether it's the Looney Tunes, you know, circles closing in yeah. or 
or the mindfulness and the presence that you were able to experience throughout that extended period of solitude tend to wane pretty quickly in the wake of those experiences. So how has that been? Like, have you been able to carry that awareness into your life in the aftermath of these experiences? That's or do the, you find yourself yeah. defaulting back? Now you're back in LA, you're back in the studio. Like how much of that are you able to like hold on to? That's a great question. Um, and sort of become the theme of my life, at least right now, <laughs> this version of yeah. Mike Posner. <laughs> um, because I kept getting these Satori flashes of everything, you know, like in the ambulance, it was peace and everything makes sense. Um, Summit of Everest, we could talk about that, but another one of these deeply just perfect moments where I'm fully present, but you're right, they disappear, go away. And it's like, you know, there's gotta be a better way to access that peace mm -hmm. than to freaking almost die or to risk my right. life climbing this insane mountain, right? Like or that. Have to, to have to go back to the monastery. <laughs> That's the next yeah. one. And so I actually went back to the monastery after Everest. Uh, actually, it's a Buddhist center. There's no monks there. Um, and they, the place I went, they have these uh, solo cabins that are set up for like solitary retreats, which I really like. So you go and you drop you as a little cabin with a single mattress and they'll see you in three weeks. And you're just on your own. Each week they drop off a week's worth of groceries, but you don't see the person. It's like in a drop box. Mm -hmm. like you just don't, you're by yourself for, for three weeks. And um, I started to realize like basically if you can quiet the mind, right? Uh, that that sort of feeling of peace is just there naturally. And you don't have to like have your dad die or walk across America or summit mountains or to be at the monastery. You just need to have a quiet mind. And um, while like every moment of my life is not gonna have the same emotional potency of finishing the walk or of almost dying in the thing or being on the summit of Mount Everest, of course not like, all of my moments, I believe, have the potential to have an undercurrent of peace in them and at least right. awareness, you know, being where I, where I am. And so I'm back in LA now and I'm essentially doing <laughs> the exact same thing I was doing before I left on the walk. I go to the studio, I work with artists, I help them write songs. I sometimes write my own songs. I produce songs, but everything's different on the inside. You know, I, I, who I am is different. And that's sort of just like the marquee on the show. That's like what I'm doing on the mm -hmm. outside. Well, on the inside, my practice, and I mess it up more than I get it right, Rich, you know, but my practice is like, when I'm in the room writing with someone and they're speaking, I'm trying to be present. That means nothing's in here. I'm not, I'm listening to their voice, not what the voice in here is saying about what they're saying, right. trying or maintaining some awareness of the physical sensation in my body, you know, as I'm working and, and yeah, there's some of that piece is, is here with me for sure. You know, and sometimes it's easier than others being around you, you're a peaceful guy. Like we connect, whatever. It's, e it's easier for me to do it with you than if whatever. But um, that's my practice. You yeah, know? I would imagine that's a creative superpower. You know, the idea that, you know, it's, it's calm at the bottom of the ocean and it's calm at, you know, 30,000 feet. You're above the clouds, right? And having that clarity or that open space opens the channel for that, creative instinct or impulse to yeah. channel through like in the moment when yeah. you're working on a song. When I was at the uh, Buddhist center, uh, I did this like, I would meditate sitting five hours a day and I'd do like three hours of walking meditation. Sounds like hard with like, it's 
It's awesome, actually. Right. It's all it's, relative. You walk across <laughs> America, so a three-hour walk. No, it, it's split <laughs> yeah. up, like three, one okay. hour. Three. And like, yeah, it's actually a lot easier than regular life because um, nothing's there to upset mm -hmm. you. So if you find yourself Except upset- your, your mind is attacking you constantly. Yeah, well, if you find yourself upset, you know I'm doing this because there's nothing wrong here. Mm -hmm. I have everything and no one else is here. <laughs> you know? Anyways, the, the story I but wanted- the mind will search for that thing to hang its hat on. Exactly. Pull you out of that but moment. But like when the, uh, I'll circle back, but the, you're right. It will do that. The mind is clever, cunning. Um, and in my mind, like the voice, which I just call a voice in my head, I nickname it Charlie. Because when, when I, in the absence of more stimuli and other people speaking and all stuff, you really start to hear Charlie. And like, you start to notice Charlie's trends. Well, Charlie has some patterns. I've, mm -hmm. I noticed one is he's freaking way more negative than I thought. Like a lot of doomsday scenarios, like, hey, what if I do that? And then this might happen and that might happen and all that, like, and then I might die. He was right. like, whoa, whoa, how do we get there? <laughs> you know, so we got that. And then the other thing I noticed about Charlie is He's incredibly repetitive. Like the same thought over and over and over and over again. It's like, I got it, man. I got it. And uh, I There's had this- Charlie again, looping that thing that yeah. he always talks about. Yeah. It's so and annoying sometimes and boring it's benign, after a while. But sometimes it's a negative thing. It's like, dude, like, all right. Uh, there was one day, I think it was on fifth or sixth day there, I did my two hours sitting at the beginning of the day and I was just like, Charlie's getting quieter and quieter. And then he's just like kind of gone. And the two hours ends, I stand up and I realize that even though I'm not sitting anymore, meditating, I'm still meditating and it's no Charlie. And I go to make a snack, like it was a, I had a piece of wasa bread and I put an avocado on it. And while I made it, still no Charlie. And I closed my eyes, I took a bite and it was like fireworks of flavor. Like I could tell you, Rich, this without reservation is the best meal I've ever had in my life. And the main ingredients like quiet mind. And so I, I tell you this story to, to say, when the mind is quiet, what's left is hard to, hard to put into words what's left, but it's not just like blank. It's actually like, it's like, for, for, forgive me for this. I can't think of a better way. It's like taking the condom off life, man. Mm -hmm. You're like, this is how avocado really tastes when I'm not covering it up with all my judgments and talking in my head and analyzing things. It's like, it's like, I remember putting a sock on on my retreat and feeling like I was having sex, like I'm putting a sock on my foot. Like all the set, the senses are heightened because it just like we cover them up with just this blabber box in our head usually, you know? And so there, it turns out, I think, at least for me, when we, when we quiet Charlie, it's not this like state of blankness. It's like, there's a lot there. It comes <laughs> yeah. alive. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. And that's what I was feeling in the ambulance when I looked at that red paint and it looked brighter. That's what I was feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think like thinking about reality is like putting on real dark sunglasses and mm -hmm. dulls reality and, and presence is like taking those sunglasses yeah. off. But I think that practice of naming your thinking mind allows you to create that distance and that understanding that there is your mind, which is good at keeping you alive and doing menial tasks, yeah. and, you know, sort of propelling your body and into forward motion, but it's really not your friend when it comes to so many of the important things. And creating that separation allows you to understand that there is a gap and a distinction between your higher consciousness what it feels like, the experience uh, of being truly present in your life. Yeah. And the looping negative thought patterns of that thinking brain. That's right. And that in truth, 
you are that higher consciousness. That's right. You are and not that voice. And identifying because we all we all over over identify with the thinking brain. That's right. Right, and we think that's who we are. That's right. And developing the capacity to understand that that is not who we are, and that this is a voice that we can choose to listen to or dismiss, I think is a really profound practice. It's it's deeper than you can ever imagine, mm-hmm. right? And, and freaking uh, hard. Yeah. A continual thing and and um I work out on it every day, but I would say I'm definitely like there more than I ever have been in my life. Yeah. And I'm not on the walk across America. I'm not at the monastery. I'm 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 living a, a life. Right. Of, you're like, in the world. Yeah. 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 It's, That's that, what I thought. it's that adage of like it's easy to be serene when you're in the cave you know metaphorically like you're the you're the monk on the, in the monastery or in the cave removed from the real world that's going to be an easier situation in which to cultivate stillness and quietude but the real like advanced degree is can you carry that into the world that's and right practice that when you are immersed in stimuli and challenges etc yeah that's right and uh When I was on retreat, I felt that it w- it was a lot easier there. It's like it's set up to do that. It just gain a foothold, you know. Uh, I had a book while I was at the Buddhist Center by Titnat Han, and um, there was a line in it, and it said, "Retreat is about reentry. Retreat is about reentry." So, what's that mean? He said that if your retreat is not making you a better member of society, a better brother, sister, husband, wife, when you go back, you're wasting your time. You're not going there to like feel, this is what I used to do because I've been to that place three times when I was in there. I thought I was like going to gain some superpower or something, or at the very least, I was going to gain experience that I could talk about and tell other people, I did this thing. Or I thought I was going to like put something on. Mm-hmm. Well, that's BS, man. And uh, it's, it's selfish. Like when you go on retreat, you should come back better. That's what the retreat is for, you know, period. Mm-hmm. And um, when I think about that experience, when I think about Everest and the walk, those are all kind of retreats. And so, yeah, what I'm up to now is is practicing that stuff internally and then trying to share the, the, the stuff I learned because those are pretty cool and, and, and privileged experiences, you know? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people can't take three weeks off of work and go sit alone in a cabin, you know, or walk across America. I mean, these are very unique and beautiful experiences I was blessed to have. So yeah, my life um, now, I'm just, I go to the studio and I try to be present and also I just start doing like some uh some speaking and like storytelling where I oh, cool. where I share some of these stories and because I just want to share some of this stuff yeah. I learned, you know. Yeah. yeah. On the walk, and I promise we're gonna get to Everest. <laughs> no, it's all gotta, good. I know. It's all good. One of the things that occurred to me in thinking about like what this was about for you and and the different mic that kind of emerged from it, from the mic that began it is this arc of, of transcending the ego. Because on some level, yes, the walk is about you, but deep down, we're all egoistic and you are promoting an album on some level. And you're like, oh, if I do this, this will actually get a bunch of attention. I'll get a bunch of validation. And you had this imagined vision of, of being joined by like this huge group of people as you walked into Los Angeles and all of you together would throw this big party and you'd all go into the ocean. But what happens is there is this destruction of the ego along the way where you're forced to kind of meet yourself in a new and different way, such that when you arrive in Venice, it's really about the relationship between you and you. And you eschewed the temptation to have a lot of people there and chose to just have your closest friends and to walk into the ocean by yourself. And that's a really beautiful like, like evolution, I think, of Mike Posner and perhaps 
that was something that you had to contend with again during Everest. And because we are all naturally egoistic, it flares up. It's not like you've just transcended it, but you, and you are this person who, who has a public facing persona and has to contend with fame and everything that kind of comes with that. But I think that there's something really profound in that attempt, the striving to mute the ego, to tap into a greater level of humility and gratitude. And then just in you describing how you approach your studio time now, that strikes me as somebody who's who's kind of showing up in service to these artists that you're working with. Trying to rather be, than like, yeah. hey, what am I going to extract out of this yeah. experience? It's a lot different. Sometimes you won't even write a song. <laughs> you know, sometimes the I can see a person just like overwhelmed with their their life. I'm like, just go for a walk. <laughs> we don't yeah. have to write a song to get today. I don't care. But yeah, man, you're right. This ego thing. It's, it's not even real. You know, like when I, when I think about who I am, who is Mike Posner, it's like this loose amalgamation of random memories that aren't even all the memories, right? Because I forget most of the stuff that happens to me. Mm -hmm. These memories and then like some cultural archetypes, like characters from movies that I've like mixed up. I'm like, that's me, that's my personality. And then you weave a story around You that. weave a story it's around this it. trauma happened to me and this is why I'm this way. Right. But this, this story slash concept, concept slash idea, I just realized one day like, it only exists in my head. Like nobody else in the entire world has that picture of me in their head. They have, if they even know who I am, they have a different picture and it's much less fleshed out and mm. they don't care as much about it. That being said, none of these, none of these like story slash concepts slash identities in our heads are real. Not like this is real, like this is a real thing. They're just like these amorphous things that, that have no actual um, tie to, to reality. And um, just remembering, like, they it always wants you to feel like you're separate, doesn't it? The ego. Right. Like, that's what the ego is. It's like, I'm this thing in the world. I'm alone. And But in, like, actuality, it's not true, of course. Like, we come from our parents. We're attached to the planet, of course, and, like, deeply... Uh, inexplicable ways like we would if the sun was a mile further back we'd all be frozen you know like we are connected to to everything and and uh just just like remember to make that shift life it just seems a lot better <laughs> better yeah when separation. i'm living from the from the big place not right. the ego place you can't walk across america climb everest and climb the however many mountains you climbed in preparation for everest and not feel a deeper connection and sense of interconnectedness with the greater whole. There is some disillusion of the ego that would have to take place with that. Yeah. Because you're meeting nature on such a grand scale. I think so. I think I think it can go either way too. Like they talk about that with psychedelics fuel, too. Right. <laughs> like it could sometimes. fuel your ego. I did all these yeah. things. This is who yeah. I am. I'm Mike Posner and I'm my, my resume. Yes. I'm the only <laughs> Grammy-nominated Grammy guy who's climbed Everest and walked across America. Yeah. And that is who I am. <laughs> yeah. It could, yeah, it could go that way. Um, so that, that's like up to you, I guess. You know, mm. Up to me. Mm -hmm. Right. So you finish this walk along the way, or at some point, this idea of Everest occurs to you. Yeah. It's probably occurred to a lot of people. Yeah, but you decide you're actually going to act on it. Yeah, it was the it was the snake bite over the Rockies where I'd start like I I could do anything. And uh, that that sort of dream I dreamed about it before, mm -hmm. like I fantasized about, it. and it started to mutate slowly from a dream into a a plan. And I just the, remember. It wasn't that long after the walk where suddenly on Instagram, it's like you and Colin yeah. were 
were you at Mount Hood or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it was two you weeks on a, later. On a climb. Two weeks later, because I was already talking to Colin while I was on uh-huh. the walk. I said, man, is is Everest like as crowded as they say? Is it like, because, you know, there's a lot of yeah. hoopla about Everest, misinformation, and he'd been there. So is it crowded? Like, is it really, is, is it like, is it worth it? Like, is it beautiful? He was like, you know what, that feeling you get when you go to the Grand Canyon? I said, yeah. He's like, it's like that, times a hundred. I'm like, that sounds pretty good, you know? Um, and so, you know, he had done a lot of big projects, Colin. Sure. So he he kind of gave me some advice, like how to end the walk. And then he said, look, do you know anything about climbing? I said, nope. You ever worn crampons? Nope. He goes, well, why don't you come climb Mount Hood with me after your walk? I said, great. I go, but look, like, I'm really going to come, you know, like, because we never met. I'm like, uh-huh. I'm really going to come. He's like, okay. And uh, so, yeah, two weeks after the walk, like, I was still... Still pretty darn sore, but he took me up Mount Hood and we we summited it. And uh, I asked him, you know, if I want to keep getting better at this, how do I do that? And he goes, you should uh, you should talk to Dr. John. And he introduced me to Dr. Mm-hmm. John Kadrowski, and that's the man that became my my coach and my guide over the next year and a half. And um, I just I'm all in. So I moved, I moved like basically next to John. I got a rental house there. In like Colorado? In Colorado. And uh, we just freaking trained our butts off the next year and a half. What did that training look like? John has a great line. He says, uh, he says, train for climbing mountains by climbing mountains. So that's what we did. When we, we got to Everest, you sit in base camp a lot, like waiting for the right weather and your body. And you start to like forget like forget you're a climber because you're just sitting there waiting Mm -hmm. for so long you know and like my whole that last year and a half I've been climbing like every few days like you know and just hitting like all the 14ers 14ers we went to uh we went to Ecuador climbed the volcanoes there we went to Pakistan we went to um, for Pakistan was K2 yeah that's a whole other thing I just and went to you base were there, camp. You were there when the the Nepalese crew summited in the winter, right? I was. I had left a few days before, mm. um, but yeah, I was. I was at that base. I just went so to base you went, camp. You went up to base camp, right? That's it. I mm. I don't really want to climb K two, man. Yeah, I always well, tell not in the winter at least. I don't want to climb in the summer either. <laughs> I always tell people that when I was doing Everest, I'm like, look, believe it or not, I do have a line, you know, because uh, everyone's. A line of acceptable risk, their risk tolerance is different, and it's fine. Like you, you climb within that that risk. And K two on the other side of my line, man, forget that one. <laughs> but um, yeah, we 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 climb. Uh, and we this climb. was like full time. You're living in Colorado. Full time. You're there for the sole purpose. Of full time. John had control of my parent. schedule. Right. So you know, somebody called. Hey, Mike, can you come? Do you want to do this thing? I go. I gotta ask my coach. I had asked, you know, uh-huh. I didn't have to. I wanted it to be like that, you know, and uh, and he would ha- he have control of my schedule first, right? So he'd say like, at the beginning, we're gonna do this, 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 and this, and then I'd put the rest of my life in between mm-hmm. the mountain, like, cause I told him, I go, look, I have no interest in going to Mount Everest if I don't belong there. Period. I won't be one of these yuckle putzes that show up and they never like. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, there's a lot of those. There's not. There's like. As I don't want to do that. I've, it doesn't interest me. I want to go on this journey with you and become a mountaineer. And when you, if you think I'm ready, we go together. It's great. We'll get you ready. And and he did. So, anyways, we we're at base camp a year and a half later. And like I said, you you just sitting there waiting for like a month for the right weather. And I said, sort of forget like that I'm a mountaineer now that I'm a climber. And so I took a notebook out and I had my phone, all the pictures and stuff from the summits we'd done. And I just made a list of all the mountains we'd climbed just to give me, instill Remind some confidence in myself. Prepare. Yeah, and I, this list, I couldn't believe it kept going. It was 71 mountains long. 71 right. we climbed. Mount Everest was the 72nd we did together. Yeah, that's so, wild. So in the preparation, what did you, like, cause I have no experience with high altitude climbing of any kind. 
I have an idea of what I think goes into tackling something like that. And you being a newbie going into it, what did you discover or learn that defied what you expected it to be? Like, you're like, okay, we're gonna prepare for Everest or this is what it's gonna be like. And then you're like, oh shit, I didn't realize it was this. Yeah, I mean, so many things. I, I remember our first, our first mountain, Crystal Peak, uh, we start climbing. And you know, on your backpack, you have the little water bottle holders on the, uh-huh. on the side. So I have my water bottles in there, right? I get to this, we some is like a 13er. We get to the summit, John goes, take a drink of water. Take my water bottle, it's, for, it's a block of ice. Can't drink that. He goes, water doesn't go on the outside of the pack. Uh-huh. Okay, like, right. like day one. One thing, yeah. <laughs> day <laughs> one, you know what I mean? That water's gotta go. I wouldn't have go thought of that. Against, yeah. I, I didn't think it, it's gotta go on the, against, it, against your back in the pack. So it stays liquid, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And then when you go like, I don't know, just when you go- Like probably a million things like that. There's a million things like that. But then even so, like getting to the big peaks, because Everest, my first 8,000 meter peak there, there, everything's just up a notch. Mm -hmm. So even then you put put your water in like another thing. And the thing I, I, I really wasn't, you, I feel like I couldn't have been prepared for it was just the way that altitude hit me up that high. I mean, I'd been high, I'd been 20,000 feet plus, um, but this is another 10,000, like 29,000, you know, 29, yeah. 29. So, and it's exponential, right? Going from sea level to 1,000 is a lot easier than going from 26,000 to 27. I mean, light years different. Mm-hmm. And I just felt like up there, I just felt like horrible. I just felt like a zombie. Like I couldn't sleep because, you know, we're talking about a third of the oxygen right. that you and I are breathing now. You wake up gasping for air. Yeah, as soon, cause the, you know, the respiratory system slows and sleeps. So right when I start to, <gasps> just mm. my body does suffocating. And so, you know, <laughs> on the summit push, you just, uh, like no sleep five days and you get real. The other thing <laughs> people don't realize is yeah, on the summit and stuff, it's really cold, but you come down that same day. And as you get a little lower on the mountain and the sun comes out, you're still in that down suit and you start to cook, man. Yeah, I know you shared on Instagram some post where you were stripping down to like the gear you were wearing when you walked across America. Yeah, like, well, that's like, the thing. I wore these. hot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you just like the 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 exhaustion, the dehydration and the, the altitude, I won't say sickness, but yeah, it is, man. Mm-hmm. Like you're up there and you're probably at about just being there, just being there, Rich. I was about 15%, I would say. Right. And then you got to climb the mountain with that right. percentage. There's only so much acclimation that occurs. Well, acclimation makes it so you can do it. Mm. but doesn't make it feel good. I know that during you know? the training phase for this, you went out to Poland though and did the Wim Hof yeah! <laughs> experience with all those guys. That was awesome. I was. You were supposed I, to be there, weren't I you? Know. And I don't know what was going on with me. And I, I couldn't go. I probably could have, you know, it's one of those FOMO things where yeah. I don't know what's going on. Like that's the point, right? I can't even remember what it was that I Has had. Has Wim do. been on your show? Yeah, a couple times. So yeah, have you yeah. ever practiced with him? I have. But yeah, then that's what we did. You're I good. <laughs> but I wanted to have the Poland experience and I wanted to go with all you guys. Yeah. You know, I was invited and it's like a thing. I and then when you when you guys were there, I was like, what why what's why didn't you do that? And Q said the same thing. He was invited too. He didn't come. It looked like a blast. Hey, it was uh that practice, I think, is life changing, man. Right. It's so really the, deep. The thing is, like, did you so with those practices, were you able to apply them at base camp and above to try to help like self-regulate a little bit with yeah, the lack of oxygen? Both of them. I'd say like sort of the two cores, and there's some other stuff, of course, but like I say the main two pillars of Wim Hof's method are cold immersion, right? He does these mm-hmm. ice baths and breath work. And both of those were <laughs> yeah. helpful for me. You know, one is like, 
look, just everyone knows, like if you, if you, if you live in LA and you take a plane and you get off in Detroit in the middle of winter, it feels a lot colder to you than it does to someone living in Detroit. Right? Right. So same process, like as I was getting ready to go to Everest, there was a river by the house that, that I was renting in, in Colorado and you just get in that thing in the, in the middle of winter and just, you know, you take a cold shower. Mm-hmm. Cold shower in Colorado in the mountains is a cold yeah. shower, you know? <laughs> in the, but the and, thing is, the, the difference is like, if you go out and, and you run every day, like you're gonna become a better runner and you can kind of get used to the cold a little bit, but there's a cap on that. Like it's always hard. Yes, but I believe, look, don't quote me on this because I was looking it up before Everest. I believe there is an acclimation process. They were saying like they they had some guys do ice baths and they were at the beginning, they were shivering after mm-hmm. two months or whatever. So I think there there's is a that. study. Yeah, and I've noticed that just through doing it myself. Yeah. So, but it never gets, it's not like, oh, this is easy now. It gets easier, I would mm-hmm. say, for easier me at least. Um, you are at the end. Then you start to really like it. I don't know, like yeah, for me. that's I true. St- I still will like stall before I actually get in, but the high I could get yeah. from the cold. Anyways, yeah, man, I would just try to like make sure I got cold once or twice every day um, before I showed up to Everest to just change like my body's metric of what cold mm-hmm. was. And then the the breath work, yeah, I did. I did all the time um, there. And um, I really believe in this practice so much so that I'm actually studying to become a instructor. Oh, wow. I'm doing like the online courses. Are you? That, yeah, because I just want to, um, I just want to share that practice. Mm-hmm. It's so good, you know. Right. Yeah, it's 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 beautiful, and um, the the output of the breath work is so asymmetric to the input. It's like the input is breathing, you know, fully, and then you do some holds and whatever. You've had Wim Hof one, and. And uh, the output is like this amazingly blissful, peaceful state that's like sometimes like borderline psychedelic. And you're like, how, like you can do, I felt like someone gave me a cheat code to my own body. That was like, how am I 33? And I didn't know like, you can just do this whenever you want. It's yeah, really cool. at any time. With breath. It will change the experience of, of your entire day. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm a meditator. So I, I meditate twice a day, every day, pretty much like, I don't know, eight, nine years now. And if I ever really get in a funk, like if I just like feel depressed, I'll do that breath work. And it seems to like shift. It just seems to be able to pierce through. It has those. a much more dramatic, immediate effect than meditation. Yeah, I would say so. And those things are both great, but they're different yeah. qualitatively, I yeah. think. So- I agree. So you're I up agree. at base camp. Um, one of the things that uh, that is wild about all of this, like and I didn't realize this, I was looking a little bit more deeply into your story, is, is how normal avalanches are. That you're hearing them like all the time when you're at base camp from yeah. a great distance. Yeah, you get there and you hear these thunder <sighs> rumbles and they, they sound loud. And you go and you look at these mountains are big, man. And you, you're like, where? It sounds like it's coming down on you and you find it and it's like so far away and it looks this big. You know, it's giant, but it's really far away and the mountains are so big. Um, So after, you know, we're talking like, you probably hear that five times a day at least. And over a period of weeks, I started to become desensitized to that sound, just became kind of background Mm -hmm. noise. Um, But Everest is, it's really dangerous. It's really real. Um, Basically for every 100 climbers that go above base camp, one one perishes. Um, In fact, before we saw a weather window that we liked, John and I, um, four climbers that, you know, weren't on our team, but were in base camp with us were dead. Mm-hmm. 
And yeah, uh, so you got guys going up, not coming down. Um, we had a we had a That's friend. That's some heavy shit when you're like, I'm next. Yeah, we had a friend that went up and came down with really bad frostbite. And uh, I was just thinking like, <laughs> what am I doing here? Like what? Why, why am I risking my life here? And all the, all the bad reasons became really apparent. You know, like there was some part of me that wanted to be cool and tough. And it's like, well, that's a pretty dumb thing to die for. Right. And the, she's so all these just like reasons. We were talking about reasons before, like for me not to do it, but just one commitment for me to, to climb as I said, I was going to do it. Right. The I mean, follow through similar to, you know, after the snake bite. That's right. And, uh, like, what does it mean to say you're going to do something and follow through on that? Yeah. But then acknowledging like the ego part of it. Yeah. There, I mean, the validation part. Yeah. I was, so there was a plethora of reasons why I was there and, and a lot of them were cool. And some of them weren't, um, which by the way, I think we even talked about this last time, it was true to walk too. Like, you know, part of me wanted to be like, oh, that guy's cool, you know, yeah. whatever. And like, so, but that was, that Everest was so dangerous, so real, like death, so close that that ceased to be, the looking cool ceased to be something that was pulling me up word on the mountain it became something that was pulling me down it was like hey man if, you, if that's the reason right here you should turn around you know and it was just all, the only thing i had pulling me up was that commitment man mm -hmm. and uh we saw a window we liked after in late may and we climbed to camp two it's about 10 hours and it was snowing hard it was like a snowstorm a couple of days so we stayed at camp two but we knew there was good weather for the summit in a few days, but we just had to wait. And the thing about uh, like steep mountains is it's not good to climb steep faces the day after it snows. That's when avalanches happen mm -hmm. because it's just all this new snowpack and it's, you know, gravity pulls it down. So we're just waiting, you know, after this snowstorm a day or two before we went higher because we had to go on the low sea face, which is just it's real right. steep. And we were at camp two, 21,300 feet. I hate that place, man. It's the worst. Like, I just feel horrible there. Can't sleep. Uh, and you're just there for a couple of days. You're yeah. just in the tent. You can get out of the tent. And we had like a dining tent, which disappeared. I'll get to that. <laughs> like, uh, basically, um, yeah, you can, I mean, you could walk to the, there's like a latrine tent, whatever, but it's hard to do anything. Right. You know, you walk from where I'm sitting to your sitting, I would be breathing like this. <gasps> like it's, I mean, I just, I can't explain the mm. altitude, how, how hard that makes, every, how bad it made me feel. And it hits different people differently. And that was another part of my journey. Um, I go in the tent one night at camp two with John. John and I are in our tent and I'm pretending to sleep. And I hear one of those rumbles. I don't think anything of it because I've heard it so many times by now. And it stops for a second. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> our step tent starts to shake like from all angles. It feels like we're about to be picked up, blown off the mountain. A hole rips in our tent. Snow's hit me in the face, filling up my sleeping bag. I'm screaming, John, 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 avalanche, avalanche. I'm like, I'm sure in that moment I'm dead at camp two. The avalanche is hitting our tent. And then right when I'm screaming, it just freaking stopped. And I'm like looking at my hands. They're still shaking. And I'm like, how am I alive? What happened? And we figured out that basically this avalanche slid, but it stopped just before hitting our camp. 
So what we felt was the air blast of the avalanche is like final breaths, basically. But still the damage is real. Like that dining tent I told you about was gone. Just from the air. Just like, yeah, because it's so big, so it, it, it displaces all that air. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and we were lucky, man. The camp next to ours, Elite X Beds, Nims's camp, was like destroy and thank god they weren't there they were already at camp three they, oh, they were they had already gone up they left wow. the day but before they would have been toast i mean something bad would have happened for sure it like it was but the, it's like we had time to feel sorry for ourselves it's still like in this moment i'm like what am i doing right. you know it's getting real <laughs> what am i doing don't want to die here and it's still like there's all these reasons like to turn around just that commitment to integrity to pull me up and so we climbed the next day to camp three um slept there next day to camp four and then you got a few hours at camp four mm -hmm. to turn it around right and, you got like uh, four or five hours and then you got to hit it yeah and it takes it. two hours to get ready like getting your tank on your big suit all this and you're stuff. not really sleeping right no that's what i'm saying i didn't really sleep well i slept okay at camp three because that's where i put oxygen on Camp two, I didn't sleep at all. Like we were there three days. I felt just bad. And then, yeah, from you leave three, you go to four. That's, I got there maybe 11 a.m. And at 6 p.m., I'm going to start getting ready. And, and are uh, you, you're hitting the supplemental oxygen from that point forward. Once I put it on at three, I never take it off. So once you put it on, you don't take it Sleeping off. Sleeping with it, it's on all the Sleeping time. Sleeping with it. You, if you somehow take it off or run out, that's worse than having never put it on. That's really bad. Because you've re-acclimated. Correct. To, when, you're, when you're doing supplemental oxygen, is that like sea level oxygen density? I don't know. It's still really hard to like, I'm still yeah. really out of breath. Uh, I so think it's just- Even with it, you're still, you're still struggling. It's oh, not yeah. like, oh, it, now I feel totally normal. No, no, not by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, it did help me get some, some Z's at camp three. Um, but yeah, moving real slow up there. Mm -hmm. And it depends how much you have and how uh, how many liters per minute you have it set to. Right, also. you open it up all the way, but then you're gonna run out. That's the thing, like how many bottles do you have? Uh, so, and, and that's what you gotta be responsible for, like knowing how fast you're going as well and uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, at, at camp four, we had that that window from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. to rest. I remember this sort of a strange story. I don't tell that much because I, I don't really know how to tell it that well, but I like went into some strange trance, like almost felt like I had psychedelic. I was having these visions there. Granted, I know the altitude had something to do with it because we were just under 26, like 25,900. And for about an hour, I was laying in the tent with my eyes closed and just, see, just seeing visuals. And I don't, it, it, it almost, yeah, it felt like peaceful in some way. Like I felt a little bit removed from experience like the like you're always doing something like managing mm -hmm. something on the mountain and i remember that experience kind of felt like it was giving me a zoom out and then it was then it was time to go and uh start getting ready at six about 8 30 p.m it was you know it's dark and the wind was blowing pretty good but we thought that um once we got out of that saddle it would it would be better and i'm climbing in a team of four dr mm -hmm. john who we talked about myself and then our two local guys dawa cheering sherpa and dawa dorje sherpa and those guys are like those are my buddies man i still talk to them like a lot and uh we just start we start going and um you're so worried about being i was so worried about being cold you hear all the stories frostbite and stuff that we so started going up kind of that first face and I was like sweating and you don't want to sweat on big right. mountains like that because the sweat freezes. freezes yeah. And so you- And it's, the, and it's dark out. It's dark, yes. Yeah, 8.30 p.m. when we start. So we're climbing through the night 
and where our aim is to be on the summit around sunrise. I started sweating. I'm like, man, I got to stop, take some layers off. So I stop, I take a layer, all these climbers start passing me. And that's the other thing you wear, you don't want to be in a traffic jam up there. Mm -hmm. So after a few hours, there's a natural resting point called the balcony where everyone takes a break because it's just kind of flat like a balcony and there's this crazy view. And I said to John, I said, well, look, when we get to the balcony, let's take like, everyone else is going to take a 10 minute break. Let's take a three minute break and let's pass everybody. He said, great. So I get there and uh, we take this three minute break and we pass like everybody except there's only four people in front of us now. And uh, I don't usually uh, eat caffeine, but like your appetite also disappears up there. So I was just eating like, you know, the gels. Right. With the caffeine, the cliff shots. And I was just like, I feel like I had <laughs> another gear. some pep yeah. in my step under like the, unlike the days before. And, and uh, Dawa Cheering and I, we, we ended up passing that group of four. And then there was like these two headlamps way above us. And we, we kept climbing. We got up there on the South Summit and the, they had stopped. It was our friend Eric's. He was like, hey man, I think I'm, I was going too fast. I didn't want to get there in the dark. So he was just sitting there waiting. And then John came up. He was like, nah, let's go now. And he's like, we're going to hit it perfectly. So mm -hmm. so we walked past Eric's and then Eric's came behind us. And um, Dawa Cheering was in front of myself and uh, I just remember like he he went and he, he went on the summit and he turned around and uh, he looked me in the eye and this is like this moment where you, you would think maybe you'd you'd feel some pride up there like I did it that kind of thing I'm looking this guy in the eye who's carrying my extra oxygen, you know, and it's like, no, nah, I'm here because of him, because of John and because of Dawa Dorje. That's the only reason I'm a, I'm allowed to be here, period. Like if I had to carry all that stuff, my, I don't think I could do, have done it. And so instead of this pride, it's just, it's just hum some cocktail of humility, gratitude and and love. And I basically... Hugged him. John came up behind us and and hugged me, and I flopped onto the summit. Man, I just I buried like my face in my hands on the ground, and tears just exploded out of my face. And uh, I remember I said these words. I said like they like dribbled out. You can always come here. I was like, this took everything. This took everything. And uh, it was it was just such a beautiful moment, man. Because John and I had been working so hard for it to be up there with them. We were both just weeping, and um, just like in the back of that ambulance, you know, it's like there was peace and everything made sense. Yeah. How did it differ from? the many times that you had imagined what that would be like. Like, what did you suspect yeah. it would look like and feel like versus the reality? That feeling of possibility that I had after the walk, that wasn't there. That wasn't there. Um, The, in other words, that idea, like after the walk, like, oh, I can, there's way more in me. Like it was on Everest, a, like, oh, I did everything I could, but I'm only here because of these guys. Yeah. Like that, love that of humility. That, and just like, I didn't, I didn't want to do anything harder than that. I still don't. Mm -hmm. Maybe I shouldn't say harder. I don't want to do anything more dangerous than that. In fact, I wouldn't do that again. You know, I wouldn't. Uh, my, my risk tolerance has changed. But, The, mo the moment itself was, this is one of the best moments of my life. You know, it was everything in, 
and more. It was just beautiful. It was perfect. It's beautiful. People don't realize mountains have shadows, but if you go get to a summit on sunrise, you see the shadow. I mean, seeing Mount Everest, giant pyramidal shadow mm. cast over hundreds and hundreds of miles is like, it was come on. clear too. I mean, I saw that Well, it's photo. clear. Like, here's the thing. You like, so high you got to realize you're so high. You're yeah. above the clouds. Yeah. So, I mean, it's that's always going to be clear up there. Yeah. There's not, it's not always clear. It can be bad up there, but uh, on some of the weather reports, like you'll have like that snowstorm we had, right? Mm -hmm. Where we were waiting in camp too. Well, that storm was at 7,000 meters and below. Like that's where those clouds were. So once we passed 7,000 meters, like there was no new snowfall there. We didn't have to worry. You know what I mm -hmm. It's just interesting. Like mm -hmm. you go above the weather to yeah. me. So the moment was, I don't know what I, what I expected, but it was perfect. It was, it was unreal, man. I, it was everything. Um, the way the journey itself affected my life was totally different than the walk. You know, where the walk almost, like we talked about, was momentum to do Everest. Uh, Everest was momentum to be here, mm -hmm. to be present. Um, I think that's a really beautiful and mature takeaway from the experience because it's very easy to just let that turn you into an adventure junkie where you've gotten some spike out of that experience and you then, you know, basically devote a ridiculous amount of energy towards like just trying to repeat that or feel something again. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and a lot and, of those and, guys and, suck, man. And you're, you're, <laughs> you're kind of like missing the point because you're ultimately running away. Correct. Or you're escaping your reality yeah. versus like, really leveraging that experience to, you know, go deeper into what you just said, which is like how to be more present yeah. and how to have more gratitude and yeah. humility and all of these things. I think we might have talked about it last time. Did we talk about when I met Ram Dass? I don't know. I don't Maybe. remember. At the if risk I don't of remember, repeating. Other people don't. Yeah, so. that's fine. <laughs> so I met Ram Dass, I don't know, eight years ago before I got into all these shenanigans. Mm -hmm. And I'll make this a quick story, but basically I got invited to spend some time with him at his house on, on Maui while he was still alive. And I had uh, read some of his stuff, listened to some of his talks and he had had a stroke by then. And right. so he was in the wheelchair and he basically said a, bun a bunch of stuff I heard him say before, right? But there was something like he just loved me and my friends that I was there with. He didn't know us, but he was exuding this like, I don't know, like deep love for us that it was like a body high or something. I mean, I walked out of his house, I keeled over and I was crying. I felt so connected to like the rusty gate and like the dirt and the cow shit. Like it, it, he did something just by being him. And so I thought, I want to do, like, I didn't feel like I was in the presence of God or anything like that. I just felt like, hey, he's somebody who's done his work on himself. And I thought, I want to do that, you know? I want to, I want when people are around me, them to feel that. And I honestly, when I stop, I can't really think of anything more important to do, you know, yeah. than, than that. And, uh, when I'm hearing you talk about like these adventure junkies, like the all those times those guys suck, man. You're like with them and like they like they don't they don't feel like like they don't feel how like it feels to be in the room with you where I feel like comfortable and and like it's it's just good. Like you have a you have a peaceful energy and like that that that's like it more comes, it comes from decades of, you know doing some work and struggling and yeah. all of that stuff. I mean, I think on some level, the person who is that adventure junkie is seeking in their own way and they're at a surface level of self-discovery. Mm. And hopefully like I see the best in people and that will lead them to yeah, other you're things right. that will deepen That's a their better way of saying trajectory. It. But you're I right. think um, 
if you get, it's like anything, if you get stuck, then you're, if you get stuck in a certain realm, like you're, you're uh, shortcutting your growth, right? Like you always have to, like, you always have to like transcend whatever experience you have, like take what you can learn from it and then try to, you know, iterate on it or go to the next level. I mean, there's a, there's a saying in, in, in AA, you can't transmit something you haven't got, right? Mm. So when you're telling the story of Ramdas, it's like, that guy's gone so deep for so long and he's carrying such a heavy vibration of love and wisdom and experience that yes, there is something really true and beautiful and magical about being in the presence of somebody who who, who has gone that deep and you can definitely feel it, right? Yeah. And it's very infectious and and you know, like when you when you have that experience, you're like, I want to, I want to be able. To, there's look, there's a lot of charlatans out there. There's a lot of people who can go. Anybody can go and repeat whatever Ram Dass has said or their yeah. version of that. Yeah. But when you're with them, you can tell. Like <laughs> if you're tapped in even just a little bit, you can tell the difference, <laughs> right, between the hack and like the guy who's That's like right. speaking truth from a place of deep understanding. That's right. And so, yeah, for me, it's like, how can I, how can I, how can I go to that place so that i so that i can transmit a vibration that comes from experience not something i read in a book yeah that's right have you ever had uh these experiences like the opposite of the charlatan experience where the charlatan is like this person dressed up and they're like supposed to be like that guy and they're not where i've had these experiences where people who are not supposed to be that guy or girl or they are sure so for example it's like, like politicians it's like who 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 wants that job it's like it's it's there's a there's a um uh an inappropriate incentive that's attracting the wrong people to yeah. that robe so anybody who wants to be the guru ultimately <laughs> can't really be the guru yeah but i've had these experiences where people who don't want to be the guru have guru qualities right. such as like i'm in the, i've been in the studio with rappers in clouds of marijuana smoke draped in 40 gold chains and like I, I look in their eyes and they're like they're there you know and I'm getting like that kind of feeling from them and it's like wow okay yeah I'm pretty sure forms. you never meditated but yeah. but you're but well, you got it you know mm -hmm. you're I can just tell you're you're present like when I'm speaking with you you're right here with me you're not somewhere off in the future or in the past like I can feel it you know, I always think that's cool too when that yeah, happens, right. those that's unexpected wild. ones. <laughs> um, you were at base camp for a long time, man. And I think I didn't really appreciate just what a huge extended endeavor the whole Everest thing is. Yeah. Like you're, you're out for months. It was two months door to door. Is that longer um, than normal? Because it, it was, seemed like you were sharing on Instagram. You're like playing concerts in some kind of like <laughs> coffee house or something. I'm like, where is he? Yeah, it is like, like you you're could, just hanging out for what seemed like forever. Yeah, we were, you know. So you know, below base camp there are these villages, you know, because you hike you hike a week to get to base camp, and along the way there's these villages in the Kumbu Valley of where the Sherpa people live, and uh, if you get bored, you can you can go down to one uh -huh. of the villages and. Um, being a little lower altitude or, you know, for a day. Anyways, uh, there was a, there was a hurricane, I think, or typhoon or something in the Indian Ocean. And that was causing the jet stream to stay on Everest longer than usual. Mm. Now the jet stream hits Everest summit usually 50 weeks out of the year. So that's pretty much unclimbable, at least for my risk tolerance, you know, you know, we're talking hundreds of mile an hour winds, you don't want to be up there. And usually in May, late May, when the season switches from spring to um, the monsoon season, there's these two weeks where the, the, the jet stream gets pushed off mm. the mountain. And um, this, uh, this hurricane just messed it up and it was just staying on there longer than usual. So we had an extremely late summit June 1st. Um, so yeah, we were there. We were there a little longer than we thought. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that creates some other problems like lower on the mountain because 
it's hot. It starts getting hotter and, you know, like the anchors and screws start to get a little loose mm. and fall out. And, and more, the hotter it is, more stuff falls. So, I mean, after that, that close call in camp two, that sound wasn't background noise anymore to me. Right. And so I you just kept hearing them. And uh, we, after we summited, we got down to camp two, really compressed it. Well, that's a trip. Like the false finish, when I talk false finish line, you summit, but you're only at camp two. You got to go down through yeah. the ice fall. So it's, just, it's like eight hours up, but then 12 hours down or something like that. It was about, it was about a 17 hour day. So, cause, cause we started that day at four, mm-hmm. summit it came down at two, but you go to bed and you summit at Everest, but you're not done. You're still freaking on Everest. And actually the most dangerous part of the mountain statistically is the lowest part, the Kumbu Icefall. That's where all the crevasses are and mm-hmm. the um, ladders and the, the, that kind of thing. Oh, you still gotta do that. So low. That's the first thing you do on the South side. If you climb from the north, look terrifying. To bed. I've seen all the videos. Yes, it's just like <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> I want no part of that. You know, we had practiced the heck out of that mm. too on ladders and stuff, so it was pretty comfortable. But it's just interesting. Like you practice on all these ladders in America, and you get there, and you're wearing crampons. You get there, and like the steps are all smaller, so it's like <laughs> it doesn't fit the same way. Uh-huh. Anyways. Um, and Colin and Jenna were up there too. Right? Yeah, they went so on I the same maybe days. You went as, it, you all went together, but they went up on a different day. No, same day. Oh, they did? Yeah, same Just day. later in the day. Um, they left a few hours after us, I think. But once you get to camp four, we just lost contact with them. I mean, the wind is howling. We didn't know what tent, what person's in. Um, but we, we summited. And then when I was coming down, I saw him coming up. And I saw Colin and, uh, and Jenna. And they were, you know, they were they were pretty much there. I knew they were going to make it. It's mm-hmm. pretty cool to see but that. But that's like a cool moment. Cause you're <laughs> he like, has this this, thing. that's the guy I was talking to on the walk across yeah. America. And like, yeah. actually here we well, are. Well, he right helped now. me so much. He yeah. gave me so much advice, but he does this joke with me because uh, like I'm this musician, right? I'm out like in these crazy places with, with John and him. So anytime like I'm in a place that I guess like I, on paper shouldn't be like I land in the Skardu airport in Pakistan. He always comes up and he's like, he goes, oh shit, is that Mike Posner in the Skardu airport? <laughs> I'm like, what's up, man? They're like he's always doing these like in the Grand, right. T- oh shit, is that Mike Posner on the summit of the Grand Teton in Wyoming? You know, he's got these like folder and then <laughs> he did the one and actually it's just like really cool. Uh, like in that moment where we crossed on the, we were on the Hillary uh-huh. step and he took his, th- oh, I don't know, shit. he didn't have his phone. I think he had the GoPro. So he's like, oh shit, is that Mike Pose on the Hillary step on Mount Everest? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You should do an edit on all of those together. We should, right? we should. Wow, man. Yeah. So here you are in the wake of, of all of these experiences. Like, how do you, like, what's the, like, how do you make sense of all of it? Like, what is the what is the wisdom that you then carry into the studio? Like, how does this? I'm interested in how this all congeals with and like works with the art and your expression. That's the easy part. I mean, that just happens. Quincy Jones said, "The deeper the human you are, the deeper the musician you are." It's true. Um, so my perspective is totally different, you know? So where I write from is different. I don't, I don't have to try to do that. You know, the, the inspiration just comes up and, um, it'll, it's, it'll just be different. It'll be right. But it gives you you something to say. I mean, you can't be an artist if you're not living your life. So if you just sat That's in right. a studio in Hollywood for the last four years, you could create technically good music, yeah. but it's not, it, it would be devoid of the depth that you can give it now that you've lived like these rich experiences. Yes. And there's a balance, right? Because there's skills involved in what I do. Uh, that I wasn't focusing on. And in some way, some of those things probably waned a little bit. My guitar chops are not as, yeah. you know. Um, 
But you're right. That I've had periods of my life where it was the opposite, where I was just writing a song every day. And after a year of that, I'm writing some song about, I don't know, is it in my early 20s, I'm writing some song about like being at a party and I'm realizing like, when's the last time you've been to a party, man? You don't <laughs> right. do any, you just You just write. That's all you do. <gasps> and, uh, and, you know, I always talk about this experience I had with Redemption Song. Bob Marley. It's my favorite song. I'm listening to it one day and I'm thinking, I know all the chords in this song. I can hit all the notes and all the words in the lyrics are in my vocabulary. So why haven't I written a song this good? Well, that delta between wherever I am, wherever redemption song is, you know, is is not found in the studio. It's not found by practicing guitar or, you know, making my voice better and voice lessons or learning new words by reading. It's something deeper than that. And uh, I think that's part of the quest I've, I've mm-hmm. been on. Mm. Yeah, you got to have a deep reservoir of life experience to get to a place where you have something to say worthy of a song like that and worthy of you being a steward of that expression. And when the universe decides that you're ready, I have no doubt that it'll just flow out of you without without the thinking, (laughs) without, what's it, Charlie? Charlie. Without Charlie getting involved. Charlie's not gonna have any part in that one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you came out of the gate with this uh, with this freaking catchy tune. Mama always told me, yes. I can't get that out of my head. Hey, hey. Like, I don't know what it is, but you have a knack for like writing these songs that like just get lodged in the brain. Like that, Thank that you. like pop sensibility, mm. you know? I don't know like, where do you, I got that. Do you that. think about that? Or is it just, I'm just doing what I feel? Or do you think, I know that these are, are characteristics of a pop song that work. And so I structure my lyrics or my beats around that. Like, how does it come together? You try not to think about that too much, you know? Um, But there is a frame, like there is a medium. We call it a medium of the song. What, it's about three minutes shrinking as our intention spans shrink, you know, songs are actually becoming shorter. And there's like a typical structure to the medium, which is there's a verse, a pre-chorus, a chorus, another verse, another pre-chorus, another chorus, maybe a post-chorus, a bridge, one more chorus, and that's the end of the song. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we play with this form. Right, in the the way a painter plays with a canvas that's mounted on a frame. And sometimes we say, hey, we're not going to do it. Maybe this song not gonna, just going to have one verse or, you know, whatever. We're not going to use that. And, uh, but the medium exists, you know, before me. And so I'm, I'm toying with it. And uh, it's all about what you're trying to accomplish. And, you know, I guess what the spirit is calling you to do sometimes, like, sometimes you think of a melody that's extremely catchy, but it's like almost so catchy. It's kind of mm-hmm. corny. And you go, I don't, I don't, that doesn't fit you know um so it's it's just it's always different yeah yeah the music industry just seems to be always changing so quickly i mean it's changed so much just since the last time that we talked oh yeah um you know now it's about tiktok and having your your songs trend there and i know you've had some success with that (laughs) but the idea of like i'm going to release an album versus i'm going to drip songs out like How do you even approach it strategically to think, you know, thinking about like, this is how you do it now, or this is the way the music kind of environment functions versus the days when we were growing up where it was, you put an album out every couple of years and tour on it. Yeah, that's certainly changed. Um, For me, I'm just trying to create like, or live the life I want to live. and don't want to right now at least go on like a big music tour. 
I'm really interested in speaking. I just did my first like uh -huh. speaking thing. I went to Ohio State and did like a oh, that's cool. 45 minute talk where I shared some of these stories and had like some slides and and then I played like a few songs acoustic at the end. That was awesome. You could do a full one man show that way. Yeah, retreats about reentry. You know that's what it's called. Retreat. No, but that's why I'm doing it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like okay, you got to do all this cool stuff. What'd you learn? And can you share it with with other people? in a way that adds value to to them. So man, like I'm probably the wrong person to ask about like how we market music now. <laughs> I don't really you're know. You're just trying to hold on to the purity of what you do and let that stuff take care of yeah. itself. But you're doing like, like a combination of writing for yourself and then working with other yeah, guys. Yeah, cause I really enjoy that, you know? And, uh, and sometimes the writing is just an excuse to share some of this stuff. You know, what younger artists, I didn't have anybody tell me what to expect mm -hmm. or what to do 10 years ago. It's a wild, lonely industry, you know, especially when you have success. So that, um, and then as far as like how I'm sharing this stuff, like I'm playing around on TikTok. I'm just being real on there, yeah. like showing what I do. I sprout, you know, I, I make know. music and that's <laughs> about it, dude, you know? <laughs> and no big crazy adventure on the horizon like not do you right feel now. like people are like well what's next they like, do ask me do? that it, it that's the there's no mm. next right it's like that's what i learned there's no next it's only here it's only now like to anyone listening to this like news flash this is your life this is it whether you're like got the earphones in while you're making food or whatever like look around like this is it you know and who said, maybe it's Titnet Han. He said, if we can't be happy now, we can never be happy. I think he, he quoted the Buddha saying that we have to make this moment the most wonderful moment of our lives. Um, so that that's like my snarky answer. And then like on the external plane, I'm up to stuff. I'm, I'm doing the speaking. Uh, I'm making music mostly with others now. Mm -hmm. Um but I'll make another album for sure at some point. Yeah. And, uh, and as far as the adventure stuff, I'm taking a break. You know, that, that Everest was really real, man. It was, uh, it's just so easily you could have not come back, you know? And so I still love being in shape and exercise and that, like that's a part of my life, mm -hmm. but you know, putting my life on the line. And if you die, like who's it really hurt? Not you, you're freaking dead. It's like my mom, you know, like that's not really, you know, and there's certain things I, I would like to think I would die for if like she was in harm's way or you know, but just to like have a cool experience to like access a piece that, I think can be accessed in other ways. I wouldn't. I wouldn't risk my life for that anymore. Yeah. And um, I think that's smart. That's a good move. Yeah. So it's <laughs> it's cool. I I feel really good, man. I feel really uh -huh. good. Doctor John and I are also um we're talking about this idea maybe next fall of you know speaking of retreat is reentry and, and sharing. We're thinking about hosting like a s small group, maybe 15, 16 people on the trek to base camp. Mm -hmm. so that's actually like kind mm -hmm. of the coolest, one of the coolest right. parts of Everest is just being in the Sherpa villages and there's no cars. And we're thinking about like uh, hosting a trip there, but we're figuring that yeah, out. Yeah, that's still. pretty cool. Yeah. And didn't you, weren't you well, like working on a song with Tom Morello and like laying down lyrics on your iPhone like when you were <laughs> at base camp? No, that, so, well, first of all, I got to work with Tom Morello, know, man. That's like, I'm a big Rage fan since I was little. So um, we 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 had this song done and it was an idea I had I sent to him and then he did his thing with it. And basically, you know, I, I produced the song, which like essentially means like I should be overseeing the mixing process mm -hmm. and like taking the song from, it's one of the hats I wear, producer, like you, you, you like finish it, right. you know? <laughs> But I didn't, I just like left to Nepal. And Tom's text me like, yo, have you heard the latest mix? It's like, you know, when you nitpick stuff, hey, the reverb's too loud in verse two or whatever. And I'm just like, dude, I can't, cause there's some crappy Wi-Fi at base camp. 
I said, look, man, I, I, I see you sent it, but I can't open it up. Uh-huh. And I ever base camp. And I, I came back home and he was like, I said, I FaceTime, I was like, yo, I want to apologize. Like, I really like kind of dropped the ball on like finishing, finishing the mix. And he was like, oh, he's like, it's all good. He was like, so you like, you trek to base camp. Cause that's the thing. Like, that's kind of a life changing trip. People do, they do the trek to mm-hmm. base camp. And that's what me and John are talking about hosting in the future. Um, I said, no, I summited. He was like, what? You summited? <laughs> I was like, yeah, man. He's like, oh, shit. He's like, it's all good, man. We'll finish the mix, you know? <laughs> right. So, yeah, we got it yeah. done. It's a I, pretty legit excuse. Like, couldn't get back to you. <laughs> Sorry. Or is it, you know, Camp 4? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But that song hasn't come out yet, has it? It, it came out, oh, I want to say, on Tom, it's Tom's song. Uh-huh. Tom made an album that's not a rage album where he collaborated with all these different artists and uh, got like Springsteen's on it and Chris Stapleton and all these names that I don't deserve wow. to, to be on the CD with, sure you know? You and, <laughs> no, it was just, it's really cool. I think he put it out a week or two ago. Mm. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. I didn't know it was out. Yeah. Well, dude, I love you. I'm such a, uh, you know, a fan, not just of your music, but just you as a human being. And I really enjoy being in your presence. And I think the way, the choices that you've made about how to live your life, how to conduct yourself, how to um, be a public figure with integrity and live your life in such an authentic way is truly inspiring, man. And uh, I'd like to have more of you in my life. Uh, so I really appreciate you coming here today. Hey, listen, man, that means a lot. And uh, what you're up to is so beautiful. Like you you have some of the most like beautiful people in the world on your, on your show and you share their message. Um, and, and people hear it. I've, I've met them. I, I'll say that's probably like of all the interviews I did on like the, on, I was telling you before, I think we started recording on the walk, you know, like people showed up so much many times and all these different states that cool. said they heard your podcast and um, beyond like just highlighting your guests, whatever they're up to, you, you take the time and the, and create a space where you like you really see them and that's a gift like when you when just by some of the things you you reflect back i can hear in your listening like you you get me on a on a level deeper than than uh m- most people like then you get from just like having a conversation with somebody yeah. so oh, that's I a real that. gift you know to to share with other people um to your listeners, but also each person, I think that sits in this chair gets that from you, I, I presume. Thanks, Thank man. you, man. Appreciate that. Speaking of gifts, are you willing to share a song with us? I don't have you a guitar. Think? We they have a guitar you're... here. It's not your guitar. I want to test it out. I don't out. know. We'll see. Yeah, let's if do it. If it meets your standards, then we can do it. Let's do it, man. All right, cool. Of course. Yes, they rob I Sword out to the merchant ships Minutes after they took I From the bottomless pit But my hand was made strong By the end of the Almighty We flower in this generation Triumphantly So won't you help to sing These songs of freedom Cause all I ever have Redemption song
Emancipate yourself from mental slavery None but ourselves can free our mind Have no fear for atomic energy Cause none of them can stop the time How long will they kill our brothers While we stand aside and look Some say it's just a part of it We've got to fulfill the book Won't you help to sing These songs of freedom Is all I ever had Redemption song